Hi, third graders. Welcome back to your TV classroom. Today is Friday, March 5th. We made it through the week. Hooray! I hope all of you had a great evening last night. Before we begin, let's check in with our zones. How are you doing today, third graders? Are you feeling tired or kind of moving slow? Are you calm and focused? Are you frustrated or excited or mad or angry? Mr. Kevin, how are you doing today? Well, thanks for asking. I'm doing pretty, pretty good. Great. Even though I can't talk. <laughs> you know, I have those days up here on the TV classroom where my brain goes faster than my mouth and it can get pretty silly. <laughs> how about you, Mrs. Wally? I'm in the blue zone. I did not sleep well last night and I had a hard time waking up and I am trying really hard to stay awake and alert today. But sometimes that happens and so we just push through and do our best. So I might also not be able to talk today, so I apologize ahead of time. Well, yep. you sound great and well, you okay. look wide awake, Mrs. I'm so Wallen. glad I look wide awake. At least, you know, I find <laughs> that when I'm really tired, if I get myself up and get ready to go for the day and put on nice clothes, that helps you feel more awake and mm -hmm. better. So that's what I All did right. today. All right, friends, let's get going with our Fact Fun Friday. What is four times five? If you said 20, you are correct. Four times 10? 40. Four times 50? Hmm. Well, if I know four times five, I know four times 50. Four times five is 20. Then four times five tens is 20 tens, which is the same as 200. Ooh, four times 49. Oh, we could make this complicated or we could think about what we know. If we know four times 50, that's four groups of 50 or 50 groups of four, then we know four times 49 because it's four groups of 49 or 49 groups of four. We just take one of the groups of four away so what's 200 minus four? Think of friends of 10, what goes with four to make 10? 196. Now I could check that thinking. I know four times 40 is 160. And I know four times nine is 36. And if I add 130 and 36, I get 196. It worked. Four times 45. What is it? Well, four times 40 is 160. Four times five is 20. So what's four times 45? 180. Hmm. See how it went, yes, Mr. Kevin? I thought of it in a different way. How did you think of it? I, do, I took two times 45, knowing that that's 90 <gasps> and adding 90 to 90. That's a, you, can, you can split whichever factor you want for distributive property. You can do the smaller factor or the larger factor, it's up to you. I love that idea, Mr. Kevin. So Mr. Kevin said, I did a split four into two groups of two. So two times, and then added the, the back together. So two times 45 is 90, and two times 45 is 90, and 90 plus 90 is 180. Done. Awesome. Today, we are learning to use estimation to check our work when solving two-step word problems. We're doing the same lesson we did yesterday. We're gonna review what we did yesterday, and then we're gonna do two new problems together. So yesterday, we talked about the zoo and the elephant Tiny, do you remember? And Tiny ate 152 pounds of food, and on Sunday, he ate 12 more pounds of food than he did on Saturday. Mr. Kevin, can you show my whiteboard really quick? So I'm just gonna review what we did yesterday. We made this bar model to show Saturday and Sunday, if you remember. Saturday, Sunday, oops, I did that wrong. And we knew we were trying to figure out how many pounds of food Tiny ate for the whole weekend. And we knew that on Saturday it was 152, and on Sunday it was 152 plus 12, and so we did our work and then we checked it with estimating. So we did 152 
plus 152 plus 12. And we decided that was 152, and that equaled the food that he ate. And we did 152 plus 164 equaled the food. And then we added that together, and we got, let's see, 2 and 4 is 6, 111, so 316 was the pounds of food that Tiny ate. And then we talked about rounding. We rounded to the nearest 100, and that was like, oh, mm, it didn't work as well. We got 400. Then we rounded to the nearest 10, and what I did is we rounded to the nearest 10 when we got here. But I'm going to talk about today rounding to the nearest 10 up here. So if I was to round to the nearest 10 with 150, 152 is closer to 150 than 160. So this would turn into 150. And then this would also turn into 150. And then 12 would turn into 10. And what's 150 plus 150? 300 plus 10 is 310. Look how close that is to 316. So we know that that's a really reasonable answer because when we estimated by rounding, to check our work, our answers were really close. So we're gonna work on that again today. We're gonna look, and we're not gonna go that fast. We're gonna look at a new problem. Mr. Herman, can you show the, the whole screen for us for a little bit? And we're gonna solve it, and then we're gonna estimate by rounding. So first of all, we're gonna read. First, we're gonna talk about what's happening and draw our model without any numbers. Then we're gonna find our question and put our question marks in. Then we're gonna put in the information we know. And then we're gonna look at what math we need to do. So Kennedy planted 222 flowers last week. This week she planted 65 more flowers than last week. How many flowers did she plant in all? Show your work. What's happening here? What's going on in this story? Yeah, there's a person planting flowers in their garden. And what's the time frame going on here for these flowers that are being planted? It says, how many flowers did you plant in all? This, last week and this week. So we've got two different weeks happening. So let's draw the two weeks. We've got, this is last week. And then we've got, this week, whoops, my little wedge is not tight enough there. Hang on, friends. We have this week. Okay, and then we're gonna have a total amount of flowers in all, right? Okay, now let's read and find the question. Let's figure out where the question mark's gonna go. Kennedy planted 222 flowers last week. This week she planted 65 more flowers than last week. How many flowers did she plant in all? What's our question that we're trying to answer in this problem? What's our like final answer going to be? Yeah, how many flowers did she plant in all? So where am I gonna put F for flowers here on my bar model? Where is the unknown? Is it in last week, this week, or the hole up top? Yeah, it's a hole up top and we're gonna put F. Oh, it's yellow, that's all right, F for flowers. Ooh, I like that, then I'll write in green for the parts we already know. Ooh, that's good. Okay, now let's read and let's look for the information we already know that we can fill in the rest of our bar model. Kennedy planted 22 flowers last week. That's important, planted 22 flowers last week. This week she planted 65 more flowers than last week. Is that important? Yeah, 65 more flowers than last week. Hmm. So how are we going to show this here in our bar model? What are we going to do? Do I know last week? Yeah, 222. Do I know the total for this week yet? No. It says 65 more flowers than last week. This is kind of like that tiny problem, right? How many were last week? 222. And then 65 more. So I need to add another 65. Okay. What do you think the equation is going to be for this problem? Hmm. 
Oh. Go ahead and write what you think the equation is going to be, and I'm going to write an equation, and let's see if it matches. I have 222 plus this week, which is 222 plus 65, equals the total number of flowers planted. Go ahead. I'm going to give you one minute. Solve and round to estimate. Okay, friends. Mr. Kevin, can you show my whiteboard? You should have gotten an answer of 509 flowers in all. That should be your answer, 509 flowers in all. Now let's round to estimate to see if that's a reasonable answer. I've put a number line up here. I put 220 and 230. We're gonna round to the nearest 10 for each of these numbers. We'll do the 65 one last and I'll change our number line. So 222. Here's 225. Where would I put that on my number line? To the left of 225 or to the right of 225? Yeah, here. So is it nearer 220 or 230? 220, so down here I'm gonna write 220 plus 220. Then I'm gonna change this because I'm looking at my 65 now. And 65, the tens on either side of 65 are 60 and 70. And then the one in the middle is 65. Now this happens to be the one in the middle. This is the one that's really tricky for kids. What do I do when it's right in the middle? You go to the next 10. So if it's right in the middle, you go up to the next 10, which is 70. So what's 220 plus 220? That's 440 plus 70 would be 510. Oh my goodness, look at that. Look how close we are to the answer we found. Super close. Super close. So I think we have found a reasonable answer. And we can say we know it's reasonable because if we estimate by rounding to the nearest tens, we get within one of our answer. That you can't get any closer without landing right on your number. Okay, great. Go ahead and reset your board. We're gonna do another one. Mr. Kevin, how long have we been going? 14 minutes. Perfect. Okay, friends, let's read again. This time, pencils down, everything down. I want you to just think about what's happening in the story. Joan earned $136 last week and $215 this week. She uses some of her earnings to buy a jacket. Joan has $273 left after buying the jacket. How much does she spend on the jacket Show your work. What's happening? Yeah, Joan's got this money. She earns it, then she spends some on the jacket and she has some money left. Okay, so how can we draw that in a model? Hmm. Well, we know that there's two amounts that Joan earned, last week and this week. So we can have a last week. And we can have it this week. Okay, and that's gonna make a total, and this is actually a two-part question. So then I have to take the money she earned, right? And she spends some, so this is the part she spends, and this is the part that's left. Hmm, so what do we have to do here? 
Let's read and see what our question is, and then let's figure out what we have to do next. Joan earned $136 last week and $215 this week. She uses some of the earnings to buy her jacket. That's what she spends. Joan has $273 left after buying the jacket. How much does she spend on the jacket? So what are we trying to figure out? How much does she spend on the jacket? So where is that question mark going to go? Yeah, on spends. Okay. But I don't even know how much this whole bar is here. I don't even, how am I gonna figure that out? Well, yeah, I've gotta figure this part out, don't I? Because this whole amount is this whole amount down at the bottom. So let's put in the information that we know and then see what we need to do. Joan earned $136 last week and $215 this week. Oh, that's good. She, last week this much, this week this much. She used some, right? She spends, we don't know how much she spends. But then she has $273 left. Okay. So where am I gonna put all of those numbers? Whoops. Where am I gonna put all of those numbers? Well, last week, $136. So where can we put that? Yeah, on last week. So we can put $136 here. What about this week? Do we know that? Mm-hmm. $215 there. And then we know how much is left, $273. Okay. What equation are we gonna need to do first before we can do this bottom equation? Yeah, Mr. Kevin, can you show my whiteboard? Mm -hmm. These ones I feel like are always much harder than the other kind we were doing. So I have to first figure out how much she got how much she earned. I need to know how much she earned. And to do that, I'm gonna add 136, last week's earnings, plus this week's earnings, right? So that's our total. And then she spends some. We don't know. We can put S for how much she spends. And she has $273 left. Well, we know with subtraction, we can just take away this part to find the part we don't know, right? But first we've got to do this. So what is 136 plus 215? Well, six and five makes 11, 30 and 10 makes 40, and 100 and 200 makes 300. So that's one, five tenths. So she has a total of $351. So instead of having the 136 plus 215, we're going to have $351 minus S equals 273. Now we know that we can just subtract the 273, so let's write that. 351 minus 273 equals S. What is 351 minus 273? Well, let's do the math. 351 minus 273. Ugh. It's one of those problems where you have to regroup. Four tens, 11 ones, 11 minus three is eight. Oh man, I have to regroup again. Two hundreds, 14 tens. Oh, 14 minus seven is seven, and two minus two is zero. According to our math, Joan's gonna have $78 that she spent on the jacket. That's what she spent. Now let's estimate and round to the nearest 10 and see what we get. 136. Is that closer to 130 or 140? 140. 215, is that closer to 210 or 220? Ooh, it's that five, it's right in the middle, so we go up, 220. 273, is that closer to 270 or 280? 270. Okay, what's 140 plus 220? That's 360. 
And what's 360 minus 270? It's 80. I believe, did I do that right, Mr. Kevin? I think I did. Let's do it, let's do it and make sure we're correct. 360 minus 270, that's gonna be 200, that's gonna be 16. Oh, it's 90, I was 10 off. Is 90 close to 78? Yes, that is a reasonable answer. We didn't get like 574, did we? No. So our answer of she spent $78 on her jacket is accurate, and is that reasonable to spend $78 on a jacket? Yeah, it is. Friends, today you're gonna practice more of this work. You're gonna do page 407 and 408 in your math workbook. It's gonna walk you through. It's gonna help you write the equations in the parentheses. It's gonna ask you, okay, what part do you need to add together or subtract before you can do the next operation? So practice that. If you get stuck, make sure to reach out to your teacher. Today we learned to use estimation to check our work when solving two-step word problems. We created models, we represented the steps with equations, we used a fluent strategy to solve, and we checked our understanding and our solution by estimating with rounding. Mr. Kevin, if they wanna ask us a question here at the TV classroom, how can they do that? You bet, you can talk to Mrs. Wally and uh, Mrs. Oslin, if you'd like, TV classroom at tacoma.k12.wada.us. They will answer your emails and they'll also respond in kind if you mail us something. Uh, they will mail something back to you. TV classroom 601 South 8th Street, Tacoma, Washington, 98405. Thank you, Mr. Kevin. All right, friends, up next is Ms. Oslin with your ELA lesson. But first, you have a break. Make sure to gather your ELA materials, your learning packet, your learning notebook, your buddy, and your pencil, and be ready to learn when she comes back on the screen. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day, and I will see you next time. Bye, friends. Rules. One, you have 10 seconds to pick your crewmate. Two, a new timer will appear with an exercise for the crewmate you picked. Three, you will get 10 points for each correct crewmate and exercise you choose. Four, if you pick the imposter, you will lose all your points. Five, see how many points you can get. Good luck.
Hi, third graders. Welcome back from your break. Excellent job gathering your materials and being ready to learn. You can take your ELA packet, your pencil, your reading notebook, and put those off to the side. We won't need those yet. But go ahead and hold on to your reading buddy or your learning buddy if they are going to help you focus. Let's remind ourselves of our three personal standards. Say these out loud with me. Show respect. Show respect. Make good decisions. Make good decisions. Solve problems. Solve problems. These are the behaviors that we have agreed to when we come together today and every day in our TV classroom so that we all feel safe thinking and speaking so that we can grow as readers and writers. Today, we are learning that writers think about memories from their past that create strong emotions. And one way that writers come up with ideas is you can either think about a memory first and then think about the emotion that came with that. Or you can think of an emotion first and then think about a memory that you have associated with that memory. And usually it's these memories that stand out and that we remember so clearly because we have strong emotions associated with them. Writers often convey their emotions in their stories so that readers can feel the emotions too. We're gonna do this with an old favorite. Our tree named Steve. Mr. Kevin, do you remember this, this story? I love this one. I know you do. This is by Alan Zwiebel and illustrated by David Catro. And if you'll remember, Our Tree Named Steve is based on our author, Alan Zwiebel's memories of the milestones his children experienced near a special tree that they had in their yard. And we learned how Alan used to used a letter format at the very beginning to, um, to explain how important these memories were to us as readers and remembering how it supported a swing. Do you remember that? How the tree, Steve, supported a swing that hung from its branches and it was third base in a game of baseball. And it was even a clothesline when there was laundry that needed to be dried. Alan frames his memories in a letter that tells his children that the tree has perished, which means the tree is no longer there, but continues to live on in their hearts and their thoughts. Here's that letter. Dear kids, a long time ago when you were little, mom and I took you to where we wanted to build a house for us to live. But in order to build there, men had to come and clear the land. I remember there was one tree, however, that the three of you couldn't stop staring at. Adam thought it was crying. Lindsay said it looked nervous. And Sari, who was only two years old, couldn't pronounce the word tree and called it Steve. I love you, Steve, she kept saying. And then Adam and Lindsay started saying it. And before too long, mom and I got the hint and asked the builder to please save Steve. Now, even though we know that this is a story about a tree, these events really show the strong emotion associated with the memory of this tree for Alan and his family. And it's almost as if the tree were another member of the family. The day we moved in, Steve was there to greet us. He quickly worked his way into our lives as a swing holder, target, third base, hiding place, jump rope turner. And whenever our dryer broke down, it held our underwear with pride. Yes, right there in the center of our yard, this weird looking true tree grew to become the center of our outdoor life. Through all our barbecues, campouts, dance parties. Or when Adam and Lindsay started getting crushes on the Simon kids next door, Steve adjusted to our every need. Now the illustrator, David Catro, who's one of my favorite illustrators, also incorporated cartoon-like images so that as readers, you and I can enjoy the children and I think the animals too, emotional reactions. The colors 
also reflect the mood and tone of what happens with the tree. So looking at this picture, look at the, I'm looking at the dogs and they kind of look like dogs that I would see in a Dr. Seuss book, right? They're very cartoon-like. And I'm noticing all the vibrant, rich, bright colors that makes me feel happy. And this is a happy memory associated with this tree. So as writers, that's something that we can do as well when we illustrate our writing is we can make sure that our drawings really hold the emotion as well. And it wasn't always easy standing tall through snowstorms in the winter or when Uncle Chester napped in the hammock, couldn't possibly have been fun, not to mention the time the sewer overflowed and Steve sucked up all the smelly water before it drowned Kirby. I think Kirby's the dog, right? Up on the, the doghouse in the background. Then got so sick himself that the tree doctor had to give Steve a haircut that made him look like a big thumb. Through the years, mom and I have tried to show you in a world filled with strangers, the peace that comes with having things you can count on and a safe place to return after a hard day or a long trip. Which brings me to the point of the letter. Last week, a storm hit our area. So there's already been a lot of emotions associated with Steve, right? The joy of moving into the house, how much fun it is to play outside as a kid, or as the kids grow up and they get crushes and they like other kids, or when the sewer breaks, that's kind of grody. And though we spared Steve's life a long time ago, this time we couldn't save him. It's not a pleasant emotion but it's still a strong one. Are we sad? Sure we are. But even in his final moments, when he could have fallen on our house, sorry swings, Kirby's house, or mom's garden, Steve performed his last trick and protected all of us to the very end. And friends like this are hard to find. Now there again, our illustrator, David Catro used bright color to convey the emotion. And I'm looking at the house and it even looks like the windows of the house are the eyes that are kind of, and then the window is the mouth. And even the dog has their head down. That is sad. So when you come home from grandma's next week, Steve will not be able to greet you as he's done in the past. I'm sorry. But please know that Steve will always be with us in our hearts, in our thoughts. He used blue there, like the zone blue, sad, right? And in a different tree at the other end of our yard. See you next week. Love, Dad. Now, I just realized something. I think we've read this book probably four or five times. Mr. Kevin, did you notice anything at the end there? I think I did. I what think did... I think they used some of Steve's wood to make the the tree house. The tree house. I in just the other noticed tree. that. Yeah, because it says, "and in a different tree at the other end of our yard." Wow, isn't that interesting? How we can read a book several times and still not notice certain details. Mm -hmm. Now, Steve can be associated with even more memories and emotions for this family because now he's made into a treehouse. It's been repurposed. Now, you are going to practice sharing a memory of your own that brings back strong emotions. You're going to include little details that let your that let your readers know how special your emotion is. And I'm going to model that for you today. We did have this graphic organizer, My Meaningful Memories, and I don't have it, so I'm just gonna model doing this in my writing notebook, just like you could do at home. So the first column is the memory. So I'm gonna model doing a think aloud of a memory that I might have from my life. I'm gonna think about the strong feeling and the small details to include. I'm gonna take some think time. <laughs> Now, 
my memory is when I, when I was younger, we moved around quite a bit. But when I was in third grade, we moved for almost the last time. But it's the first time in my memory that I remember being really sad about it because I had some really, really good friends and I really liked my teacher at my school that I was at that I had to leave. So my memory is moving far away in third grade. And then the strong feelings that I had, I had quite a few. Mrs. Wally has taught us that it's really interesting that you can feel more than one emotion at a time. I was sad to leave my friends. I was scared to make new friends. I was worried that I wouldn't make new friends. But I was also kind of happy because we moved into a house that had a pool and I was excited about that. So I'll put excited because that's what I was actually feeling, excited, it's more specific. Now, small details that I could include. I remember packing boxes. I remember saying goodbye. to my friends and my teacher. Oh, I remember getting a card from one of my friends. And he put his school picture in it. I might still have that. I remember the first swim in our new pool. It was really hot. And it had a diving board. And my siblings, well, my brother wasn't born yet, but my older sister and my younger sister and I played for hours in that pool. Now, you are gonna think about your own meaningful memory. You're gonna think about what happened, what is the memory. You're gonna think about the strong feelings that went with that. And you're gonna think about the small details that you could include like I did. I'm gonna remind you that we do have our feelings tree that you can think about what it is that you're feeling, remembering that you might feel more than one emotion at a time. You might feel proud and excited, but also maybe nervous, depending on what your memory is. Remember to include your memory, your strong feeling, and at least three details. Today we learned that writers think about memories from their pasts that create strong emotions. You're gonna notice how your, the writers did this in your independent reading texts as well. And you can do a written response telling us about the memory of your author and your illustrators and how they included color or pictures or words, small details to make you feel what they were feeling. And you can send it to us here at our TV classroom and we would read it, we'd put it up, we'd talk about it. Mr. Kevin, how can our third graders send us their memories? I'll bet you that some of our students have some great memories to tell, especially after this year. Mm -hmm. right? Oh yeah. Very different school year. Very different. So send them to TV classroom at tacoma.k12.wa.us. You can also mail them to our TV Classroom Headquarters at 601 South 8th Street, Tacoma, Washington, 98405. Thank you, Mr. Kevin.
Now, third graders, it's time for our affirmation. This is the time of the day when we say positive things to ourselves before we go off to do our independent work. And I really like the affirmation that I did yesterday, so I'm gonna repeat it. And that is, my story matters. Practice saying that out loud with me. My story matters. Now, excellent job, third graders. Go off and write your stories about your memories. And I look forward to seeing you back here next time in our TV classroom. Bye. Hey kids, we want to see your work. Just send your pictures and your stories to TV Classroom, 601 South 8th Street, Tacoma, Washington, 98405.